Hello, everyone. I am so very pleased to be here. And what I want to talk to you about today is what we've learned about the brain and its role in social behavior, including moral behavior. And I'm going to start with a, a comment made by the great uh, biologist Ed Wilson in the 1975. And his comment was really quite, quite provocative. He said that the evolution of human sociality is the fundamental conundrum of biology. And I think in 1975, he was absolutely right. And what is kind of remarkable is that in the time between then and now, a tremendous amount has been learned about social behavior in humans, but also in all mammals and in birds. Now, let me start to talk about value because of course, social behavior involves values. But the deepest level of value has to do with the emotional and motivational systems for survival of well-being of oneself. We are organized to see to our own food and water and safety and warmth. And the brain ensures that we do that. And by and large, um, with regard to most animals that are not mammals or birds, uh, they are organized essentially to see to their own welfare. And so it had seemed, especially in the 1970s and, and the two decades following, it had seemed to many biologists to be quite impossible to explain the moral behavior that we see in humans. If we're all organized to see to our own welfare, how can we possibly uh, be able to sacrifice some of our interests, some of our own concerns for the sake of another? And biologists, the more they thought about this, they thought, well, if there were a gene that appeared in some individual, that made that individual altruistic. The others would quickly take advantage of that individual and the gene would not be passed on to the next generation. And so biologists and Richard Dawkins was a good case in point. Many biologists came to the conclusion that we are born entirely selfish and that we have to learn, sometimes have to learn through punishment in order to be decent moral human beings. And this prevailed as the kind of understanding of the nature of moral behavior as we see it in humans for a long time. Now, it's very interesting to me that Darwin had a completely different take on the situation. In his book, 1871, The Descent of Man, Darwin raised the question, where does our moral sense or conscience come from? And he suggested that there were really three sources. The first, he said, were social instincts. We want to be social. We are disposed to be social. Secondly, we acquire habits and skills for getting along in a social context. And third, we have the capacity for problem solving, including problem solving in a social situation. And interestingly to me, this was also the view of Aristotle, but not Plato, of Confucius and of the two great Scots uh, philosophers, David Hume and Adam Smith. One of the things that motivated Darwin and has motivated uh, some field biologists is the observation that if you really watch how, for example, chimpanzees or wolves or others behave, what you see is that there is consolation after a mishap or a problem, that there is reconciliation after conflict, that there is often pro-social choice, meaning 
that there is food sharing, for example, or cooperation. There is many instances of orphan adoption, even amongst chimpanzees, male chimpanzees, who have adopted unrelated infants whose mothers were killed or died. We also see, if we look in non-human animals, we see a behavior that shows that there is empathy and caring. We see self-control, cooperation, reasoning, third-party punishment, and so forth. And this law has suggested, this kind of behavior has suggested, for example, to Franz de Waal, who is a, a, a tremendous ethologist, that social behavior is really widespread amongst mammals. It's also important as we think about the origins of social behavior and trying to address Ed Wilson's question, that we consider the anthropological data involving the numbers of uh, human-like human species that lived on the planet and that clearly lived in groups and had some form of cooperation because they were able to travel long distances and to migrate. They made stone tools, they had art. And Homo erectus, who was around for about 1.8 million years, uh, had started out with a brain that was rather small, about 800 cc's. Yours is about 1500 cc's. And over 1.8 million years, uh, they developed much larger brains. They migrated around the planet. They got themselves to Asia. They had the use of controlled use of fire and they appear to have, although it doesn't show on, on this, they appear to have uh, interactions with other uh, hominids. In thinking about sociality, of course, it's important to remember that we see many kinds of sociality in non-mammalian and non-avian species. There are social fish, there are many species of social inse insects. But what's really different about the sociality that we see in mammals and in birds is its complexity, is the fact that although there are genes that almost certainly play a role in sociality in, in um, mammals and birds, there is also room for a tremendous amount of learning and a tremendous amount of problem solving which seems not to be quite the way it works in uh, bees and in fish. Something rather remarkable happened in biology about 200 million years ago that helps us explain the kind of sociality we see in mammals and birds. And what happened was the emergence of animals who are warm-blooded, who are endotherms. They can create their own warmth. And this, as you know, was a tremendous advantage because it meant that although these animals were very small, the, these early uh, warm-blooded creatures were small, they could forage at night when all of the cold-blooded animals had to be sleeping. And in fact, they could forage on these snoozing cold-blooded animals. So it was a tremendous advantage. However, there was a cost. And the cost is very straightforward. Gram for gram, a warm-blooded animal has to eat 10 times as much as a cold-blooded animal. And that is a huge ecological constraint on the survival of a warm-blooded animal. Now, we're not sure about many of the changes that led to uh, an increased capacity in the brain for warm-blooded animals. But we do know the end result, and the end result is the emergence of cortex. And cortex is shown here in this slide on the left. You can see the sort of purple outline. Cortex is a, a kind of like a rind on the outside of the brain. The white matter are the axons leaving and entering the cortex and going to other structures. 
On the right hand side, what you can see is the really quite stunning organization that we see in cortex and that we don't really see anywhere else. It has something like six, depending on you, how you count, six well-defined layers and certain kinds of inputs come into some layers and leave by others and so forth. And we can see that very characteristic kinds of organization exist in cortex. So what allowed endotherms to survive in the long run was the emergence of cortex. So what we know about cortex in mammals is that in newborns, it's very, very immature. And that over time, the neurons, by learning and interacting with their environment, both the physical and the social environment, the neurons become much more complex. They sprout, they interconnect, and they develop very complex circuitry. So you can contrast the complexity. These are not extra neurons. These are just the same number of neurons, but with greater branching of both the dendrites, the trees, and the axons, which project elsewhere. By two years old, you can see that there is already a tremendous amount of structure. And in the adult, some of that structure for efficiency reasons gets pruned back to make the whole business a lot smoother. All of this involves learning, interacting with the external world. So that means that it's not directly uh, determined by the genes, but by this wonderful interaction between gene expression and learning. So the evolution of endotherms involves both this massive increase in the learning capacity, but then there is a cost. And the cost is huge. The cost is this, the babies have to be born very immature. Why? Because the whole idea of cortex is that it learns about the environment, whatever it happens to be. Whether it's in one kind of condition or another, it tunes itself up to the environment. And so you can contrast the independence of say a turtle emerging from its egg, which scrambles out and goes down to the water and swims off and begins to feed with the great dependence of all baby mammals on care. So learning capacity goes up, but neonatal independence goes down. Now, one way of looking at all of this is that in mammals and birds, what we're really seeing is an expansion of the domain where the brain manages well-being. So we saw initially that the brain is organized to care about me and my, uh, about me. But with mammals, we see that it's organized to care about me and mine, me and my babies. Now, how does that happen? So here, what we see is a human and a human with a highly dependent in infant. And one of the things that happens in the case of all mother-infant interactions is this. There is a flood of, an, of a neurochemical called oxytocin in the brain of the mother and in the brain of the baby that makes them bind to each other. It's as though for the mother, it's kind of like the baby becomes an extension of herself, me and mine. So whereas we saw that um, for a cold-blooded animal cares essentially about itself, warm-blooded animals care about me and mine. Now oxytocin is critical for this. Uh, it's also critical for the birth of, uh, of mammalian babies. 
And I want to tell you now a little bit more about what we know about oxytocin and its role in the brain. Oxytocin is released from the very old structure, the tiny bit of green seen here, which is the hypothalamus. And oxytocin is goes to other places such as the reward system. And we can see here where that little bit of green is blown up, that oxytocin is released into the body down this way, but it's also released into the brain. And the changes that it makes in the brain enhance social behavior. It means that social behavior, being together, touching, cuddling is rewarding. Um, and being ostracized is not rewarding, is sort of being punished. So what's the link to morality? And here the story can get very complex, but it also can be boiled down to a very simple set of ideas. First of all is that sociality begets other caring. We care for those to whom we are bonded. Secondly, other caring together with social learning begets social norms for what's right and for what's wrong in our group, in our community. And finally, problem solving in an ecology begets norm changes, meaning that sometimes as things change, perhaps it's the climate, perhaps it's the available food supply, then mammals are able to problem solve and to sometimes change the norms, the social norms that serve them well for social norms that serve them better in the changed circumstances. Thank you.